This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome to the American Theatre Wing's seminars on working in the theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, which is right in the heart of Times Square. It's the heartbeat of the theatre. Everything that is good goes out to the country, and everything in the country that is good, and some marvelous things that are happening all around the country, come back into New York. These seminars of the American Theatre Wing are but one of its year-round programs. We do hospital shows. We go to places where people can't get out to go to the theater. We go to aid centers so that we can help those that are so unhappy be a little bit lighter. And then we have our Saturday Theater for Children program, which is indeed a marvelous program. It goes to the schools on Saturday mornings, and children line up to see a play. They make that decision to buy a ticket. No child is ever turned away, but they get in the habit of buying a ticket. Not because it's the greatest thing in the world to see a Broadway play, but it's important to them to see a Broadway or off-Broadway play. So we hope that this pattern will last throughout their lives. And we've seen a great deal of evidence that it is. They are coming into the theater. And then we have the seminar programs, which is a wonderful thing in which the very knowledgeable people in the theater share their experiences and share their knowledge with each other and with students and theater professionals in the theater so that the continuity of quality theater goes on. I don't want to take up any time to tell you any more. We're best known for the Tony Awards, but that's just the carrot, really. Everyone here is a potential and has been a Tony Award winner, but that's not why they're here. They're here because they have a deep respect for their art, and they have honed their art, and they are willing to share it with each other. So before we go any further, I'm going to turn this seminar over to Jean Dalrymple as co-chairwoman. Jean is perhaps a wonderful example of what we talk about in the theater. She has been a producer, a director, an author, and she continues to serve the American Theatre Wing as a very hard-working board member. And Ed Wilson, who is a critic for the Wall Street Journal, but today he's not here as a critic. Ed is here to just talk about the theatre that he loves, and he is director at the Center for the Advanced Study in Theatre Arts. I'm Isabel Stevenson, and I'm president of the American Theatre Wing, and I'm now going to turn this over to Ed and Jean, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you, Isabel. We have so many outstanding performers today that I'm not going to list their credits. If I did, it would take up the full hour. So I'm simply going to introduce them very quickly, the ones on my side, starting at my far right, one of the outstanding performers of our time and currently in Orpheus Descending, Miss Vanessa Redgrave. Next to her, a performer currently in a play called Secret Rapture, which comes from England and is by David Hare, uh, formerly known very well in terms of her television show, The Days and Nights of Molly Dodd, Blair Brown. <laughs> Next to her, a performer whose credits alone would take the full hour, but who is currently the star of M. Butterfly, Mr. Tony Randall. <laughs> and on my right, the current star, one of the current stars of Sweeney Todd, Beth Fowler. <laughs> Way down there is a star of another kind. <laughs> she is something that is really new to the theater today. I mean new in the last 15 years or so. She is a casting director, and she has cast innumerable plays. And I don't know really which one you cast that's on Broadway now. Would you please tell us? 
And of course, Dr. Hare, we don't need to introduce her. She's well known all over the world. And the, she made a tremendous hit in the production I did, so I've always loved her. That was Pal Joey. And right, right now, she's doing what? Love Letters with Jason Robards. Yes. Occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Love Letters is really one of the most extraordinary things that's come to Broadway, and you were wonderful in it. Thank you very much, Jim. And then we have right next to her the star of that extraordinary smash hit off Broadway, Everybody's Money. And that is Kevin Conway. <laughs> Pamela Mason Brown has been around Peyton for Wright. Pamela Peyton Wright. Pop. <laughs> <laughs> Pamela Peyton Wright. Thank you. Uh, uh, and she's been around, and I've seen her in so many wonderful things. And, and right now, she's uh, starring in um, M. Butterfly. In M. Butterfly, as you're playing the wife which you played from the beginning. No, no, I haven't. No, no that's what it said in my you. material. I'm <laughs> very sorry. <laughs> stalwart of the theater and he's always playing larger than life people and right now he really has one that's Sweeney Todd <laughs> as Isabel said this is a seminar about working in the theater how performers get started how they develop their craft and how they enhance their talents and I really want to start off by asking each person on the panel uh, to tell us, in a way, how they got started. Uh, what determined their going into the theater? It's such a hazardous craft and a hazardous profession. Uh, was there one thing, one person, uh, one experience they had that made it certain for them that they would go into the theater? Blair? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I actually became an actor by default. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a surgeon. Um, and it's just very lucky for mankind that I found the theater <laughs> and I played doctors and I'm not actually operating on you. Um, I, I was in college. I found I didn't want to go to school any longer. I, I didn't want to get married. Uh, so I thought, well, now the theater looks interesting. And I thought I'd try that until I got myself together to get a real job. Um, my mother was a teacher. My father had worked in government. It never occurred to me that theater was a full-time occupation. I think I thought that actors all had other jobs and that this was a hobby. And I auditioned for the National Theatre School of Canada, which was a Saint-Denis school, a Michel Saint-Denis school, uh, classical training. I got in on a wonderful fluke and went and then thought, I'm home. This is it. This is what I want to do. So that's my little tale. That's my <laughs> <laughs> I would like to ask uh, Elaine how she started. Because I've known her for years, but I really don't know how she began. Boy, it's, I think this is the nightmare of every actress in the world. Uh, what made you get into the theater? How did you get into the theater? Um, <clears throat> none of my family had anything to do with the theater, but my mom had a very had a best friend, and his name was Bobby Clark. The young people in the oh, audience yes. will not remember him, but he was a brilliant, brilliant actor comedian. Comedian. And mother sort of knew him. Mother was very rich when she was a little girl, and Bobby was very poor, but she found him someplace on the other side of the tracks, and. They fell in love at the age of eight. And when Bobby said that when he was 15, he was going to run away and join the circus, and Mother said, can I go with you? And he said, sure. And Mother told, uh, foolishly told her brother, or wisely told her brother, and she was caught and taken home. So I've always felt that I, sh the one that went to the station. And Bobby went on to join the circus and then became a big Broadway star. So he was my only link with the theater. And I used to talk to Bobby about it when I was a little girl. And this is going to sound egotistical, and I don't mean it that way. I mean it very seriously. He said to me one day at Jane Davies Restaurants. Anybody remember that? Yes, 55th Street. And I was 15, and I thought I wanted to be an actress. And he said, I think I saw a now Voyager. I don't know. But I, Bobby Clark said to me, 
in order to succeed in the theater, you have to be dynamite. Are you? And I said, yes. And he said, then go for it. And I think it's a strange story for a 15-year-old to say that, but someplace in me, it must have been such an enormously definite desire that I just became, and I, it was not an egotistical bone in my body, I was scared to death, but I did answer that question so quickly that I feel that uh, I was okay. And we, I know that actresses used to play a game about that awful question, why did you go into the theater? And uh, I said once to get a good table. But you know, <laughs> but you do those frivolous things to get away from the real meaning of what you, and if I told you why I became an actress, we'd be here all day, and I don't want to do that. But that was an indication of it. I think someplace inside of you, you have to have such a definite feeling that you can do it, really do it. And then you go, wow. And usually people who think that way make it. I, I, Very good. Very I good. Think. Absolutely. I agree. Kevin, what about you? Well, um, I, it, it really, uh, it's sort of similar. I think it, we all, it, there's a connection really in, in terms of finding something that you have to do, you know, and I didn't, for a long time I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't get into uh, the theater until I was about 27, and uh, the, but what happened before that is <laughs> no interest. And, uh, well, it might it, be, Well, <laughs> yeah, but it, wait for my book. <laughs> the, uh, it just, uh, I went, of all people, it sounds strange, Anthony Newley, I went to see uh, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. And, uh, he, he came out, and I'd never been to the theater before in my life. I grew up in New York, but never been to live theater until I was about 26, 27. Never and, once? No. And uh, it, it just, it was that place downtown, you know, with the, you know, and I, I used to drink down there once in a while, but I'd go with my cronies, but I never really, I didn't like it. It wasn't comfortable for me. Did so, you go to the movies, at least? Oh, sure. <laughs> 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 movies, yeah. And, uh, at least. But it wasn't, I wasn't... Um, yeah. Uh, culturally elevated at all at that time, and, and, and nor am I yet. But it, uh, it, there was something, I, I got dragged kicking and screaming to see this show, Stop the World, I Want to Get Out. I didn't want to see it, I had no desire to, to sit in a theater. Uh, it all seemed weird, t uh, TV and movies seemed, you know. And the energy and connection that, that he had with his audience, and the music I think helped a lot too, uh, it just came right out over it. and uh, it sounds corny and, and all that stuff but it I sat there and I I found myself taking in the energy of the performers and then throwing it right back at them and when I left I thought what a what an interesting strange experience I've never had anything like that before still didn't do anything for me it took uh, another uh, while for me to even think about going and taking did, did you go to acting school after that or how after, did you, you did yeah. go to acting school then. right and uh, and I I studied with a, a wonderful, uh, not at the beginning, I wasted about a year uh, just uh, just hanging around acting school, you know, not really working very hard. And then there was one teacher that sort of was inspirational to me and, and who, she... Who was that? Well, her name was Ellen Green, not, of course, the actress Ellen Green. She now, uh, she married a, an Italian count and moved to Italy, you know, <laughs> d deserted me, like everybody else in my life did. She, this acting teacher did too, and she smart went, too. she was smart, she got out well again, it was good. And then uh, I studied with Uda for about, uh, Uda Hagen, for about uh, uh, two and a half years. And, uh, and you know, it was, it was pretty good once I made the decision to get into it. Pamela, what about you? <clears throat> um. I uh, I was shy. Uh, I think from earliest I can remember, I was attracted to the theater. It was the storytelling aspect of it. The, um, I never thought in the early days that I had, and, and I had to be forced to. I found myself with a group of actors in high school. It was quite a good drama department there. Where was that? I in Memphis, Tennessee, and. Um, I was uh, 14 at the time, and uh, I don't know why I was in this class. I was the only sophomore in it. I think my mother had something to do with it. She thought I wasn't, I, there wasn't enough in the school to challenge me, so she asked them for something else, and I was in a class with juniors and seniors. Uh, and they did a play. They did Blythe Spirit, so uh, I chose the smallest role to, to read for, and I got it. 
And then they did another play. They did All My Sons by Arthur Miller. And again, I chose the role of Sue, the next door neighbor. And they pushed me up to read for Kate Keller. I was just a little girl. And so I went up and I read for it and I got it. And um, I did it and I loved doing it. It was, I was in a story, you know, and I loved it. And uh, then I had grown-ups coming back and telling me that I was good. So that feeling of, you know, and that's when I guess, you know, I got the... Uh, well, I had response, you know, that was saying I was good at something and I loved doing it. So that sort of led me on. And I uh, went to college and again, I, I studied literature. I, I, I really still don't feel that university is a good place to study acting because it's not really academic. But I studied the literature that I loved and uh, then Towards the end, I thought, well, I better choose something to do. I'm coming to the end, you know, college. So <laughs> I uh, applied for um, a Fulbright because I wanted to leave the country. Uh, and for, uh, you know, not because I was, you know, I just felt like this would be a time to travel. And I wanted to concentrate on acting for a couple of years before becoming professional, if that's what I was going to do. So I got a Fulbright uh, to a school in London, but... I turned it down in the end. I tried to get them to send me to the other school that I wanted to go to, but the school they were sending me to, the reason I didn't want to go was because it was all Fulbright students. And I thought, well, it'd be like being in this country. They're all Americans. And they wouldn't see reason. So I was convinced to turn it down. So I turned it down, and Stacy Keach says he's, he got that one. And he <laughs> went to that school. But anyway, I went to school there for two years, and then I um, came back to this country on a boat. And I thought, well, I'd better stay in New York. It was right before probably I met Elaine. We were just reminiscing. But I was really from, you know, I was a shy young girl still. And um, I, I'd grown up in the South by that time. I was from Pennsylvania. Well, I got to this country. I thought, well, I'd better stay in New York for a week and face the music. I'd better, you know, this is it. I'm not in school anymore. I've come back to work. I was there about a day, and I went home to Alabama. <laughs> and, well, my father was ill, so I, I thought I'd better go. You know. And I wrote letters to, I wanted to work in rap, and I wanted to play lots of parts. I didn't want to be stuck in one thing, you know, I wanted to play. I was really, a, a, you know, an actor who likes to, I never wanted to sort of, it wasn't success, it was the literature. So anyway, I wrote to five repertory companies I chose, and somebody, thought it was, you know, there were a and few then things. And you were hooked, obviously. <laughs> yeah, and one thing and led to another, and I've stayed. Yeah. Yeah. Bob. Well, Blair and Kevin, I, I sort of backed into theater. Uh, from my earliest memories, I had planned somehow, and I'm not even clear to this day why, but on being uh, a priest. I came from a large Irish Catholic family, and uh, my role models uh, going to school were priests. I, I, I liked the fact that they were living lives of, of service, and uh, the priests I knew were very virile, uh, strong, uh, charismatic men. Um, and so I did end up going to seminary after high school. In the meantime, growing up in, in Southern California in the 50s and 60s, there was no such thing as live theater. As a matter of fact, I played leads in musicals and plays before I had ever seen one which was, a, is kind of a, a, I guess, a strange w way to go into theater, but I, I was so virginal about it. And, and again, the, re the response was amazing to me that, that people uh, would uh, respond so viscerally to what I kind of did off the top of my head or the bottom of my soul or wherever it was coming from. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I went to the seminary, and um, in the summers between my studies, uh, a friend of mine in the seminary, his father had been a leading light on Broadway in the late 40s and 50s, a fellow by the name of Paul Crabtree, who had been with yeah. the Theater Guild. And he opened a theater in Tennessee, and he came to the seminary and auditioned me in the biology lab to play the, <laughs> the uh, lead in a, something called Tennessee USA, a, a historical pageant about the, the history of Tennessee, and required a fresh-faced, open young kid who played the guitar and uh, uh, could be a semi heartthrob in, in Tennessee, and this is 30 years ago, and I've managed to be able to uh, to do that, pull that off. Anyway, I, I went back to the seminary after this golden summer of, of theater and being the kind of local star, and and uh, uh, also having some of my first real 
one-on-ones with, uh, with ladies, with girls. <laughs> and uh, I went back to seminary, and among other things, I looked around once, I said, hey, there's no ladies here. <laughs> and uh, for many reasons, uh, the Paulist fathers and myself came to a mutual agreement that perhaps my, <laughs> it was best in the interest of the Catholic Church as well as my own <clears throat> to uh, depart. Like, so I did. That's our gain, I think, <laughs> at that point. Who go on? Beth, what about you? Well, I'm connecting on all levels here. Um, here we have an, an almost uh, priest. I went to a small Catholic women's college because I wanted to, that was where the mother house of the Dominican uh, order was. And when I, I was going to go through freshman and sophomore year, and then when I was a junior, I'd enter. That was my plan. So I'd be fully educated with my degree when I left. And I was going to be a music teacher. I was going to be the singing nun, you know. <coughs> and um, the nuns didn't want me either, so I, I stayed through college and I got my degree and, and became a grade school music teacher. And uh, in the meantime, during high school and so forth, I, was, uh, I also went to a, a Catholic uh, high school and there were very small budgets on everything and there were no plays being done, but we belonged to the Forensic League. And so I'd turn up with a you know, state trophy every once in a while for oratorical declamation and you know, neat <laughs> stuff like that. But uh, I always sang. But I uh, taught uh, for several years, and I did community theater. And somebody saw me you know, do a part in community theater and said, why don't you try out for my summer stock theater? And I thought, well, that would be a fun thing to do for the summer. And I auditioned and, and did one of those you know, eight shows in nine weeks uh, at the Grist Mill Musical Playhouse, which was aptly named. And, uh, <laughs> did my first roles and <laughs> got my equity card. And I thought, this is, this is a lot of fun, but I'm really not as good as everybody else. Um, but I kept getting encouraged, and then I, I did a couple of guest artist things. And then some stuff was going on in the, in the school system where I was working. <coughs> Teachers were upset about this, that, and the other thing, and they were threatening to go on strike. And that all upset and embarrassed me, so I thought, well, I'll go play actress for a couple of years until they get that out of their system and I get this out of my system, and that was 20 years ago, so <laughs> that's... Uh, Aren't we glad that you did that? Well, Tell me, hmm. you begin, what did you do? Oh, I really have so little to tell. I just, when I was 12 years old, I saw a play, school play, and I thought, Jesus, these kids stink. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. That's, that's, that's my whole story. <laughs> What was your first job, paying job? Oh, I, oh this was in Tulsa, and uh, I got little jobs around town. Radio, I had an act. I'd work at, you know, parties, things. I, what, I developed was, what was the act? Imitations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whom did you oh. imitate? Oh, all the stars of the day, you know, Lionel Barrymore, and everybody. Same things everybody did. <laughs> <laughs> I imitated other imitators, I guess. <laughs> when did you come to New York? I came to New York to go to the neighborhood playhouse, mm -hmm. and and there Sanford Meisner made me an actor. Nicely put. Nicely put. Where? Vanessa, Vanessa? I, you now you come from a family of performers. Was yeah. it was it a choice on your part, or did you feel was it sort of taken for granted that you would go into the theater? Well, I, you never know what the rest of your family are taking for granted, thank goodness, because <laughs> if you did, <laughs> you might not manage to do anything. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, no, I, 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 it was in the war and we were evacuated and there was a boy who was four years o older than my brother and myself. I suppose I was about four and a half and his father and mother had uh, given him the materials to make himself a theater and he'd got electric lights into it. I mean, he'd made it himself with their help with money and so on. And um, so every minute we, we would get gathered around this theater and he invented plays and he did all the voices and bit by bit he grudgingly admitted that maybe I and my brother might be helping in some sort of way. So uh, we'd started to help and he found that was exciting, so then he started to write plays with living actors instead of models with plasticine that you move on in the end of sticks across the stage. 
So he started writing plays and we performed them and the audience paid a half penny, which used to go to the Merchant Seamen's Fund for distressed families in the war. And um, so it was moments of illusion. That, that's how it happened. That's, that's why I went into the theater. <laughs> it was because of your own experience, not because of... Uh, well, what, did, what, what influence do you think the family had? Well, an enormous yes, influence, obviously. But, yes. but if you're just taking, thinking you. how it all started, well, that's how it all started as far as I was concerned. But Olivier knew beforehand, didn't he? Well, I just don't know. I mean, you know, Olivier was liked making an occasion, a real occasion, so I think he thought, I'll make Michael and Rachel remember tonight, and, you know, he said, I mean, neither. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not telling us that the night she was born, her father was on stage with Olivier, and Olivier announced uh, a new leading lady was born tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and he called it, didn't he? <laughs> Do all of you all have talked, or several of you have talked about the response from the audience, what it meant that first time you saw uh, Stop the World. And all of you are performing now, except Rosemary, who is helping people <laughs> find their way to the stage. Um, tell us uh, something about your current performance in terms of the audience response, the difference perhaps between matinee and evening or weekend and weekday. And so is there a real difference in terms of, Tony, what, what is the, what is the, what difference do you notice? And what does it mean to the actor in terms of the response <laughs> you get? Well, matinees, we get old ladies. <laughs> you look out and it's nothing but white hair. And our play is... Uh, I can't even... Uh, I hope my mother does... I, I can't talk about our play. It's so, it's so dirty. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the response from... I, you, I see these old ladies <laughs> sitting there like this. It's a different story entirely. And there's one point in the play where... <laughs> Where a, a woman, not, not Pamela, uh, gives the various uh, synonyms for the male member. And, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> and last Wednesday, when she said cock, a woman in the audience went, oh! <laughs> <laughs> That only happens at Wednesday matinee. Tony, <laughs> well, I have heard that there have been more, there's been a more responsive audience in your kind of play, not necessarily your play, uh, with the matinee audience because they don't feel embarrassed about sitting next to their husbands. They're able to freely enjoy this. And women are not, you know, that repressed, but they are able to enjoy it without their husbands or be self-conscious about it. You don't find that apparently. No. <laughs> okay. All right. You find it in a comedy. In a comedy, the laughs are different uh, with certain audiences. But this is a serious play, and the re it has a cumulative power. And the end, the result is always the same. No matter what. Yeah. The performance. That's right. Yeah. But it varies, I presume, as, uh, before you get to that point in terms no, of... No, I vary. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Vanessa, you're playing the same role here that you played in London. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? Do you find a difference in the two audiences? A, a slight but noticeable difference, yes. What um, is that? That uh, the, the audience uh, are more lively here um, and less in awe of Tennessee Williams and respond with much more laughter, much more quickly. We had the, we had laughter, which, to me, if you hear laughter, you can tell much more th of whether the serious things are coming over if you hear laughter. Um, so, so here, the audiences seem much less in awe of Tennessee Williams. In England, I used to get a, there used to be a lot of people who would say, "Oh, uh, I, I, I've come to see your play, but." Tennessee Williams, I thought it'd be very heavy, but what a lovely surprise. He wasn't heavy at all. It was, it was really terrific. In England, Tennessee Williams, amongst ordinary people, has got a reputation like Shakespeare, Tennessee Williams, Beethoven, <laughs> you know. And then they come and they find that here's a man writing in, in a way that makes your eyes and ears open and you sit forward in your seat and you laugh and you feel human again. He's that sort of writer. Right. I suppose Americans know that, so don't, the audience starts that way. From don't the, you think it was you know. a wonderful idea of his to do that, to make it really melodramatic 
and to have all those lights and sounds and different things that it never had before. You're talking about Peter Hall's direction? Yes, yes. yes. Well, I think Peter Hall's direction uh, is, is terrific because he's done what Tennessee's actually written in the yes, text he exactly. wants. <clears throat> Bob, what about Hello? Steve? <laughs> <laughs> what, what about audiences at Sweeney Todd? Because you, you, uh, you and Beth are playing very close to the audience. That's one of the features of this production as opposed to the original production. Uh, what about audience response uh, in terms of different times when you play and just the response generally? Well, one of the thrills of, of doing it in the configuration that we're doing it now is that I have a very visceral sense of the audience's response, which is in turn very visceral. Uh, we, we share something uh, that I've never shared on Broadway with an audience, a, c a connection that uh, it's like an intake of breath that is shared. Um, and also, in, in terms of the matinee thing, we were discussing this in the green room, uh, I've found, I don't know if, if Beth feels this as strongly as I do, but uh, we've all joked about, on Broadway, about playing matinees and the blue-haired ladies and all of that, and thank God for them, they pay my, my salary. Uh, in Sweeney, it's the first time I absolutely look forward to playing matinees. Uh, even in the beginning, when, when they were rather small audiences, they've, they've, now our matinees are, are pretty much filled, but uh, even when they were smaller, somehow the response is unclouded. And in our play, it's, in, in our piece, it's very important right from the beginning, at least from the way I've approached playing this, this role, that the audience know exactly where this man is coming from, that they don't just see this raging uh, maniac to be, but they see a broken man and they know why he's broken, and they can start that journey from square A. It's very important. It's a very quiet moment where they, I think, begin to learn this emotionally, not intellectually. And, and it's, Susan, the director, Susan Schulman, has uh, set up the moment beautifully. It's there to be had. And if I'm up to it, it's there to be had. And I find in the matinee that it is, it is uh, subsumed by the audience much more deeply. It, I, I can feel it going out to them. And my theory is uh, that, for instance, in the evening, it, very often Broadway has become an entire social evening of um, paying the babysitter, paying the parking lot attendant, having a wonderful meal on restaurant row, uh, maybe a cocktail or two more than you might have at home, or uh, having an entire bottle of wine rather than a glass. And I think uh, the empathy required uh, by a piece like ours is somewhat dulled by overeating and, and perhaps over-imbibing. And I think that it's, it, people don't set out to do that, but it's sort of the, 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 what happens, and particularly on Saturday nights. And Saturday nights uh, are the one night where uh, we all have to work harder. I mean, the audience has to work past what they have gone through for the two hours before they sit in the seats, and I have to work harder to get them on board. So that's been my experience. And because of the dramatic nature, the melodramatic nature of this show, all of these responses are much more uh, dramatic. What do, you bring, what do you bring forth to when you say, I have to work harder to in order to develop? I have to be more well, up. What by working, mean? I mean clear myself so much and fill up with Sweeney that <laughs> they got to get it. And, yeah. and uh, it, uh, how I do that is d depends on, on lots of things. But it's, it's a kind of emotional concentration. It takes tremendous concentration. Is what yeah, it's saying. not this kind of concentration. It's some other kind that I can't even describe. Does that come from training that you've had that you can call upon, or does it come from the roles that you've had? <laughs> it comes from all of the mistakes right. I've made in it's trying right. to get to that. Okay. I think huh? that you somehow, more than ever, make the people understand your madness, because it is a madness. Well, I think that what the start of it is, is, is empathy for someone who was unable to keep his family together. And, and one thing I bring to the role, and my wife is here uh, tonight, the, uh, or this afternoon, wherever this is, <laughs> uh, is uh, I, I have a, a beloved wife and a very beloved young daughter. And I don't think any of the fellows who've played Sweeney that I know, and I know most of them personally, uh, m a number of them are married, but I don't think they have a small daughter. And that has put a button in me. I don't look at pictures or anything before I go on, but there's a button that can be pushed. And when I am in this state of, of clarity and the audience is ready for it, 
and the and the words and the music of this piece touch that button and uh, <laughs> I'm on my way it's yeah, like I being <laughs> set up on a roller coaster and once you've made to that to that height then it's Kevin, you're this is a, a okay. very important subject we were talking about because it's the audience comes into that very, very important ingredient. And I, I think if we, I'd like to hear the difference between working downtown audiences and Broadway audiences from Lair. Maybe well, it's we, interesting. We're in this sort of golden it. period of previews right now where audiences come in and they haven't read anything about the show. They don't know what they're supposed to think. They don't know if they disagree with what the paper said. They don't know anything. So the character of the audience is nightly is quite different. Mm -hmm. And it's very exciting this, this time, I find. Um, differences between downtown and uptown. I think, I think our show works better uptown. We needed a Broadway house. We needed the kind of openness and size because this is an epic play. And that when we were working downtown at the festival in a much smaller theater, um, I felt we were kind of pushing the walls and plastering people against their seats. Um, the audiences downtown are very enthusiastic. I mean, I think they're very unabashed about showing what they feel, whether they like it or not. Um, uptown, I found audiences have been very responsive. I, we, I think we were expecting a kind of cooling. Mm -hmm. But um, right now, I think there's a, great, there's a lot of energy. But there is that excitement in previews anyway, when people yeah. are seeing did, did something that they don't uh, know. Did you have to make many adjustments in moving from the smaller space to the larger space? No, mainly it was just vocally we had to f uh, find, the, fi yeah, find the space. But it's such a perfect house. We're at the Barrymore, that the yes, acoustics in that house are so beautiful theater. lovely yes. that it's yeah. a very easy house in that way. Kevin, you're in a play where I presume other people's money, a lot of the audience comes, you probably get a lot of Wall Street and investment yeah. type we, people. We get them from really downtown. Exactly, from <laughs> really downtown. They have from to Wall come Street. uptown to get downtown. What, uh, Did you do a Monday performance? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you do a Monday performance? No, we should have. Okay. It was interesting that night, uh, when, when that uh, Friday, you know, because we usually, you know, the, the stretch limos are usually clogging Manetta Lane, you know, which is, uh, in fact, we're, we're at war with this woman that lives in Manetta Lane because she just cannot abide that these limousines are parked in Manetta Lane. And they're not supposed to be, but limousines are in New York park anywhere they want. And uh, so she's uh, on a one-woman crusade to uh, get them all ticketed and things. But whittle, whittle, the, the theater's turned into a movie house. She'll know how... <laughs> How what, good she has it. What about this audience, though? Do they, do they respond to all the sort of in stuff about leverage buyouts and yeah. all this kind of thing? Well, m my favorite audience with this show are lawyers, because uh, there's so many uh, slams against lawyers in the show, and lawyers are such masochists that they love it. <laughs> and they sit there, and they come back over and over again in order to, 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 to feel the sweet sting of these... <laughs> Uh, barbs and they bring it's become a client show uh, a lot of people have been back three or four times bringing their out-of-town client in terms of differences uh, obviously we're getting a more Broadway audience off broad for Broadway for this particular show but um, what uh, during the summer we had quite a few tourists and it was interesting the people that didn't get any of the jargon about corporate takeovers and poison pills and all that stuff still knew something was happening and uh, and uh, in, in a way it, it's obviously changed after eight months uh, uh, I, I don't know I've watched it happen every show I've, I've done any long run that uh, you just get a different group of people that come later on to see things rather than the people that rush to see it in the first couple of months when it's still hot uh, but in a way they 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 uh, go more for the uh, serious aspects of the play you know what uh, Vanessa said which is so true that any decent good drama has to be funny it has to have moments of because we all have those moments I like to think anyway of, uh, Sweeney, of both and Sweeney Todd does anybody miss the audience I don't mean the audience I mean the orchestra in Sweeney Todd, you go, you've got... Would you like to <laughs> me to address that? Um, I missed it desperately the first few uh, rehearsals where we had the, um, the uh, synthesizers uh, because I didn't know when to enter vocally. The uh, acoustical instruments uh, have such a presence, uh, and of course we're uh, acclimated to them, that, and we've been rehearsing with piano, and they came in with these, you know, little moog things that kind of mush into the 
sound and we just didn't know and the music is so sophisticated um, we just didn't know when to make our entrances and then we'd watch madly the conductor and see that we were on the right beat um, but uh, now I don't miss it at all and I think that the uh, the audience has a lot easier time of becoming acclimated and we've gotten very nice um, response <laughs> about it because people do address that when they, it's one of the things that they mention and I love you know in this space the synthesizers that is um, one of his greatest scores Yes. And it just seems that There are textures that certainly yeah. are missed, yes. but in the context of, of the way we're doing it. We're I orchestra. We wouldn't have room for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't have much of a you know, I'd like to ask Rosemary a question, because we've heard references to actor training, the neighborhood playhouse, Uta Hagen, and you see more performers than almost anybody on a regular basis. How, how do you feel about the state of actor training now compared with 15 years ago? Well, I think it's much improved. You I do? Think it really is. I think um, 15 or 20 years ago, I mean, for example, Pamela felt she had to go partially to go to London to get some training. I mean, any, anyone who wanted to have real theater training be able to work in the classics would often go, uh, go to London. Uh, I mean, the neighborhood playhouse really was trained for a theater of the 50s and the 60s and, and, um, and uh, domestic drama and all that, and to, to, to deal with Shakespeare, people felt they needed London. They don't anymore, I think. I think there's a whole conservatory movement here. I mean, the Juilliards and the, and the, uh, and the NYUs and a lot of programs that are not academic, but really take you in be on basis of audition, and there's, you know, 40 hours a week of voice and singing and acting and, and all of it. So yeah. that's where I, that's what I think but of a good program. Also, we, we are gathering more, not a, a national theater where people work with each other, but an off-Broadway like Playwrights Horizons and Circle Rep and <coughs> companies like that where performers will go to to work with another performer, that's which true. is what brought the British performer into our well, light. Many as, of these as conservatories, they're, they're, they're run excellent. by professionals, not by teachers. I mean, that's actors right. who, who teach rather than teachers who totally have enough of them to have a classical theater? Oh, we definitely do. We have enough actors to have a classical theater. Well, we, we don't have enough to. money or yeah. whatever, but we have enough actors. I wanted to join in what you were saying, cause, or the question you were asked, because I came to, to New York and saw theater in New York, not anywhere else. Uh, for the first time in 1955, I saw a season with Paul Muni and Frederick March and um, Shirley Booth and Julie Harris and uh, at least another ten of the greats and they were in Arthur Miller's View from the Bridge, Van Heflin, a lot of new work, Diary of Anne Frank, Joseph Schildkraut, but predominantly new work and it was that that made me realize that theater wasn't and must not be what the theatre that I'd seen in England had made me think it should be and must be. Mm -hmm. it, it was the reason why I'd f I, I mean, I had an idea from British theatre, and I'd loved that idea until I but saw American theatre and American actors. I'd thought, you know, theatre is, is Tulle, and it's velvet, and it's trumpet fanfares, yeah. and it's Stratford-on-Avon, <laughs> and it's putting on masses of makeup, and having lovely disguises, and sometimes you wear a lovely dress, and one day you'll stand in the center of the stage, and you'll do Portia's casket scene. I mean, that was my idea of theater, until I came and saw 1955-56 season that winter. Well, and, and it amazes me to think that that, <laughs> that extraordinary talent and life that there was anybody who ever wanted to come to England to study drama because honestly I can't think that we had anything to teach them except some some wonderful actors who you could see but I can't think what our drama schools but they, did if they, they didn't teach us anything our drama schools were dreadful and they're much better now so I'm glad that all our drama schools are getting better <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you seem very thoughtful there. Yes, I was, she, uh, I was astonished that I had had such an extraordinary influence on Vanessa Redgrave's <laughs> career. <laughs> because, <laughs> because if she saw Paul Muni, she saw, saw me. It was Inherit the Wind that That's Paul right, Muni was actually, playing. That's right, it was Inherit the Wind. And it's, uh, it's unbelievable that you don't remember I was in that. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> what did you pay? <laughs> what did I play? Now uh, the reporter. Hey, show me. It was a stupendous production. Oh, yes, it was indeed. And play. Mm. <laughs> what brought you into that? But I, I changed your life and you didn't even know it. <laughs> That's how it happens, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> what about some of the audiences that love letters? Do they? Um, that's a different experience. Yeah, well, that was a wild experience because we didn't know what was. Uh, they they describe it at the producer's office as a runaway horse. No, no one knew what it was where it's going to take them, and it it was extraordinary that a reading, with everybody with their glasses on sitting at a table, uh, suddenly <clears throat> became like a. Uh, an epic piece of theater. You, took, you take two people through their whole lifetime and the audiences are so, not reverent, but they're just so emotional and they respond so unbelievably to two people sitting there reading about their letters that have been sent back to each other. And they're just people. They aren't Edna St. Vincent Millay. <laughs> they're just two kids that went to college and, and grew up together. And I'm just uh, mad about the, the, the reaction of the audience. It's one of the most satisfying things I've ever done in my whole life. And I've been in a lot of costumes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just put on my little black dress and go over there with my glasses. And then, of course, there's constant jokes about, I hope I remember all my lines and all that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, one television interviewer said to me, how do you learn all those lines? And she was interviewing me on Love Letters. So there is a woman who really doesn't do her homework. <laughs> but it was, you know, it's, it's been a fascinating experience. And I was hoping to be called on to answer the question about audiences. I think everybody has so many different ideas about audiences. And I want to tell you something. I'm very emotional about audiences. And I, it's part of the reason I went into the theater to get back to the first question. I'm just nuts about the human race. And it makes me mad to hear actors talk about, not mad, but I'd like to talk to them about it, about a good house and a bad house. It reminds me of Kennedy's line, don't ask what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And that's the way I feel about the, about the theater. I think actors should think about what they can do for that bunch of people that came out, and drove, and parked their car, and spent their salary, and walked into that theater to give their full attention to you up there. Jesus. It's quite, a, it's, quite a, it's quite a tribute to a human being. Talk about response and why you went into the theater. How many people live their whole lifetime and have two hours where that many people are focused on them? It's a joy. And I think we should try every night to please them, no matter what they are, who they are, how, anything. I think they're wonderful yes, people. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, when, I was, when I was in high school and was being coached by a nun, um, <laughs> this is one of the few acting teachers I've ever had, uh, she'd sit under one basketball hoop and I'd stand under the other. And um, when I was going to go out in front of my first audiences, and I was, of course, terrified at the age of 15, she gave me wonderful advice that I still remember and I share with other young actors to this day. Just remember that the people out there are at least somebody's son or somebody's daughter, maybe somebody's mother, or somebody's father, and maybe even somebody's grandfather or grandmother. She knew I was very attached to my family. And that's all I needed. And I looked out there and saw this wonderful family. I get goosebumps just thinking about recalling that moment. But I still do, on opening night, remember that, that the, these are people who want to love me if I'm good. Yes. You know, they want, they came here to have a good time, they, you know, most of them. How do you get, do you get the uh, qualities well? and the qualifications of being able to woo that audience? If you come out and the, woo and the audience is not there just to see you and Sweeney Todd, but they've had a good meal and they've done all of that that you say they have, Bob. But, and you have to then say, look, I've got to Go past them. <coughs> what do you call upon and where are you to, to make sure that you give that audience everything that they deserve? The demands you make on yourself, I think. I Absolutely. think pleasing yeah. yourself comes first. That right. is not, sure. that's okay. not selfishness. Okay. Before, okay. you can like yourself, 
Wow, they're going to extend And what do you do? Theme. You come out? It's a small well, theater, very small. You know, the first responsibility to me is to my character. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it, it, and what, what he would do and whatever, and I totally agree. I mean, you go out there and sometimes it's not an irresponsive audience. That doesn't mean they're axe murderers. They're no. just an irresponsive <laughs> audience. And, uh, and, and, it, it, uh, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, they, it, it, the only thing you can do to get to pass it, I mean, the main responsibility is that you're always ready. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, physically and emotionally, whatever, that you as a performer are always at peak. And that includes matinees, you know. I mean, I can't stand it when I see people walk through matinees and things like that because it's a matinee. I've because the thing is, and, and it's not I'm, you know, putting a halo over my head. I've got no choice. It's what I love to I do, and, uh, and I've been very lucky to do it. Collaborators with us. Right. Yeah. I think that's very uh, important. We can't make them do anything, obviously, but allow them to become collaborators. Theater is collaborative uh, on this side of the proscenium, but I think in the, in the moment that it happens, it, uh, in the most exalted moment, it, it's a mutual collaboration, which is why I'm sure you are so emotional about it, uh, Elaine, because you've felt those moments so strongly, and they're mm -hmm. absolutely transcendent. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I, I just want to try and provide the setting uh, as best we can um, in matinees or evenings or whenever, when that collaboration can take place, because then everybody gets their money's worth plus something that, that has no uh, monetary value. Well, it makes live but, uh, theater live because you're reaching out to that ingredient, exactly. that, that very important mm -hmm. ingredient that, that no other entertainment can do. But and can, can I just say something before we canonize the audience too much? <laughs> uh, <laughs> audiences are changing, at least in my experience over the last 20 years. Uh, can't be that long. <laughs> can't be that long. But uh, that there is... Um, uh, I don't know if it's television or whatever. I mean, you can see the way people come, how they dress when they go to the theater and their reaction. There are people that sit there and think that they can talk back to you. Uh, now, in, in my particular show, it's, it's great because it's part pseudo stand-up comedy anyway. And, but the, uh, it, it, there is a, a, something I wish that we could do to, to educate, uh, or not educate the audience, but just somehow get people to respect it a little bit more and sometimes uh, uh, the audiences do uh, uh, well, there are individual members of the audience and I don't know yeah you played in the round sure. yes. in, the, in the round <laughs> we, we could then we're the audience our feet are on the stage and the actors are right there so I make my entrance in this play guy goes <laughs> <laughs> And every time, every, this is part of the human race you love so soon. Uh, he wouldn't have the story to tell if he didn't do it. Every time, for the whole evening, every time I pass by him. I think that, I love it. <laughs> obviously, obviously, Vanessa wasn't in that audience <laughs> when they did inherit the win. Obviously, that was not. Otherwise, no, she I'm, would have gotten. No, I'm talking about playing in the. I know, I know. But so I think this that, close to you. I, I think that too is something that's important is to learn that difference of being able to work in the round with audiences. And and um, what we're talking about is, is is being prepared and and not. That's the difference between the professional the uh, performer who has prepared for their career and it knows what we're doing, has a responsibility to it. And that's what working in the theater is. And I, we're just about to go to questions from the audience and so don't go away, but please take a deep breath, stand up, stretch, and come back again very quickly and we'll have questions from the audience because this has been an extraordinary <laughs> panel. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York.
the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre, which are coming to, to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm Isabel Stevenson. I'm president of the American Theatre Wing, and I am indeed proud to have this fantastic panel that we have today. That are, we've been talking about what it is to work in the theatre, and how important everybody is in this collaboration, and how important the audience is. And I'm going to turn this over to Jean Dalrymple, who is our co-anchor, who is now anchor, and Jean has uh, something very important to say about the audience, and I think uh, all of the performers here have had, but Jean's point is a very personal one. Would you like to start this now? Yes, I wanted to say that when an audience seems bad to the cast, the cast gives up. They don't do anything about it. They just play into the hands of the bad audience. I say the thing they have to do is find somebody who looks sympathetic <laughs> and play on that person, and then the next one, and the next one and go through the audience and find the people who like it and work to them and pretty soon you'd be astonished. It becomes warmer and warmer and then by the second act they're with you. And this is really a fact. I was an actress and I used to do that and get the rest of the people in the company to do it and it worked. We did not have a dead audience at the end of the show. <coughs> Ever. Well, with all due respect, with your charm, I, I, if I were on stage with you, I would let you go after those sympathetic types. <laughs> I would go after the guy who was yawning, <laughs> particularly in my current role because I carry a razor in my hand. <laughs> and I would, if I couldn't get him with empathy, I would frighten him and then right. seduce him. Well, that's the way to do it. That's We're working together, we could get him. Right. In between this, Tony Randall was wonderfully regaling us with working with um, Paul Muni, who is one of the greats of the theater. And it, it was something I wish part of it could be shared with the audience as well. You talked about a scaffold that he had built. Can you quickly just recap a few of those lines for the people now? Because it's a very important part of working in the theater. Well, it, it gets a little technical, I'm afraid, because all of us believe that you work uh, simply and, and try to find the role and uh, leave yourself alone and let it happen to you. And he did exactly the opposite. He began acting big from the very first rehearsal, and it was terrible, just terrible. All this acting he did, and with readings of the lines and, and strange, uh, over, overdoing everything in the most cliched manner. Is that so? <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was just... Terrible, and we, uh, it was 55 actors in the company, and we we looked at each other. <laughs> this is Paul Muni, and uh, the, the, well, we knew he was a great actor, but it, it it was a scaffolding he built. He he felt comfortable. Also, he did other strange things. He he put on a complete makeup for every rehearsal. He bought $600 worth of makeup. <laughs> you cannot use up $600 worth of makeup in your career. And he put on a complete makeup, weird, long hair, short hair, beard, everything. He just, he just had to cover himself with, with disguises. And uh, they were all fake. And it was bad. And also, he, he tape recorded his role. And we'd hear him sitting, listening to his own voice, uh, you, you think good acting cannot come from just listening to your own voice. Nothing happened, and, and it was, it was uh, all this bad, old-fashioned stock company acting. Suddenly, one day, it, he has a peroration to the jury in, um, in uh, the second act. Of Inherit the Wind. Of Inherit the Wind, yeah. yes. And uh, he couldn't learn his lines. Uh, very unusual for an actor who's been an actor since, since childhood. And my experience has been that actors who have trouble learning their lines started late. But those who began early can learn that fast. But he'd been an actor since, he was, since he was, his parents were actors. And he could not learn his lines. And uh, he'd sit there with it. He'd read from the script like this and do all this acting at the same time while reading the script. And it was just, it was embarrassing. And... Suddenly, one day in the middle of this peroration, the script flew in the air and sweat burst from him. And his eyes and his voice went and he became a wild animal. And he burnt up and down on the stage, pacing like a tiger, screaming. The speech lasts, lasts about ten minutes. 
<laughs> we were like this. We couldn't speak. And there was an old guy in the company named Louis Hector. Some people may remember Louis Hector. Mm, yeah. And he leaned over to me and he said, that baby can act. <laughs> scaffolding you are oh yes what I, is yours I, I mean uh, sometimes I, I work from uh, I'm, you know sometimes I th we all work with our physical accoutrements and try to think well what does such a person how do they walk how do they breathe what clothes do they like uh, how does what's inside them express itself well it can only express itself in its connection with objects outside them um, but uh, I've, I sometimes find exactly that problem that I've, I've made a scaffolding that for very good reasons but then suddenly I find that I'm imprisoned inside it and then I have to break it down and throw it all away um, quite specifically rather like, like you're saying I mean but not, not that I want but to compare myself big, but I will I'll find uh, false something, color, lenses, I'll get the wig, I'll get it all worked out, convince myself that this is how this person would be. And uh, people say, what the hell are you doing that for? And I say, because I'm sure this person would do it, this, would have this sort of corset if it's that time yeah. and period, or would wear these sort of shoes and would have this sort of handkerchief and would, what have you, would have you. But um, perhaps sometimes I make some bad mistakes when I do that, which wouldn't be surprising. <laughs> and I find it's become a scaffolding that I've got to throw away because I can't breathe through it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you need that big place first to begin to discard. Well, I, I mean, I guess every, every right. actor does. We all, yeah. in you know, whatever our process is, we're all concerned Gee, with these questions, aren't we? I, I just want to say that I think acting is mental. I think you must grab the minds of the people and hold on to them. And it's a, a, a strange thing that you feel you can do it. And you say to that person who looks sympathetic, I am going to get her mind and I'm going to hold on to it. And hers, and hers. And you do. And you mustn't let go. And it's tremendous concentration but it holds them together, and pretty soon they come to you in a body. But it's, it's, uh, I, I'm convinced that acting is mental. I think great comedians tell the audience before they speak, I'm going to be funny, now you laugh. And they do. They build it up, and then they hit it, bang, and it goes. And that's all mental and all concentration, isn't it? We're about to turn the, um, this part of the program over to questions from the audience, and there are so many questions. I'm going to start right now. Would you please tell us and, and make it as brief as possible, because so many people want to ask. Okay. My name is Judy Jowitz, and my question is addressed to Blair Brown. You work in so many medias. Uh, do you prefer working in television, theater, or film? Well, I'm, I think probably like most everybody here, I enjoy working on good material and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what the medium is and you, the sort of pluses and minuses of each one come along. I'm loving doing a play now. I love how strong you feel, how uh, you become like a big Clydesdale, like a big ox and sort of <laughs> clodding through, whereas working in film a lot of times is sort of a war of attrition, keeping your, your sort of mental and emotional and physical you know, capacities honed for that kind of adrenaline rush, the way you have to work in television and film. Um, it, good parts, that's all it is. Good parts, good directors, good actors. And uh, that suits me fine. Thank <laughs> you. My name is Pearl Levinson, and my question is addressed to the panel. How do you sustain a top performance each time when the play is long running? You should be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to take that? <laughs> I remember what my, my wife told me, who is also an actress. She says, every night is opening night for somebody out there. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a way Thank to you. do it. 
My name is John Francis Fox. My question is addressed to Vanessa Redgrave. Did you ever see Anna Magnani in the film version of Orpheus Descending, and did her performance or any other one have a favorable influence on your performance? Uh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> 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 My name is Lexa Rosian, <laughs> and sort of a follow-up to that question to Vanessa Redgrave and Tony Randall. When recreating a role, is it hard not to stub your toe on what someone has done before? I think it's a good point. Tony? Uh, you could uh, ask that of Bob or any one of us. Um, no, no, it doesn't matter a bit. You just have to ignore it. Uh, or steal what you can. <laughs> uh, Bob and I both have played a music man. Well, you can't play music man. They will, uh, the audiences will let you play it, but the reviewers will review Robert Preston. And uh, I told Bob, I said, you never got such notices in your life as when I played music man. <laughs> but that, that's in some people's minds. But. Uh, no, you just have to attack the roles if no one's ever... How, who, who was the first Hamlet? Well, I, I think... It's up for grabs. Who anybody can play it, can play it. That's all. I think what's been happening is, is, is more and more are stars taking over roles, and it's not replacing. It is putting their own stamp they better. on a role. <laughs> and and I, I constantly hear uh, people say to me, I don't know how X was so great, because when I saw so-and-so's performance, it was absolutely marvelous. And, and that happens more and more as people are doing that. It, it, at one time, if you replace someone, it was something that, oh, well, I was just doing it. But now, you put your own stamp on it, and that's what's important. And that's what you're doing now, an M. Butterfly, Tony. And Who was the original Felix? <laughs> <laughs> Would you go on? Who was? I know when I played. Wrong. Oh, Art Carney. Art Carney. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah. I know when I did As You Like It for the first time, um, <coughs> I was really puzzled because, you know, you think, well, this is Shakespeare, this wonderful comedy, and, and, um, and I played a record, which amongst a bunch of old records that my father got, of uh, one scene of Edith Evans playing with, um, and he was playing Orlando, and it had been recorded by the BBC and put onto a record. And um, I listened to it again and again and again until I knew every route she'd been on that one scene. She hadn't recorded any other scenes. And I didn't change a thing because, um, because it was like an A to Z. You know, if you're going into a major city and you don't know your way and you don't... You'd be crazy not to turn to somebody who really does know the way and say, well, the best way if you want to come out alive, is that you go down <laughs> this avenue, take a turn on the thing, you halt there for a few minutes, wait till the traffic light. <laughs> and, and that's what I did, listening to this scene. And because I did that, that gave me a breakthrough to understanding something that I could never have understood in a million years, and nobody would have ever been able to explain to me. Only her voice and the chart that she'd made, as it were, of precisely how she phrased all her sentences. Bob? As uh, Miss Redgrave has suggested, I think the theater is such a continuum and, and so much uh, we, we get from, our, from those who have gone before us in our memories or in things we've read, things we've witnessed, even just c kind of spirits sometimes. I, I happen to have uh, worked with Robert Preston in a film some years before I did Music Man and uh, he, was, he was a riveting personality, and I'm sure I was, I was haunted somewhat by his spirit and a little uh, chased by it on stage, too. Uh, so, so these things are both negative and positive, but, but with theater, we, we take what is given to us and we pass it along, and my greatest dream is that someday somebody will have an accretion that uh, he lifted from me in something, and, and I think yeah. it's, there's great redemption in the theater because Absolutely. of that. Well, in the old days, it used to be, um, I mean, it was a piece of business was handed down yeah. from generation to generation, and, mm -hmm. and you felt lucky if you were allowed to do that piece yeah. of business. <laughs> but now, for many good reasons, the attitudes are different, but still. 
some of my first work was with Michael Langham at Stratford, Ontario, and at the Guthrie. And I remember doing Merchant of Venice with him, and he had been Tyrone Guthrie's assistant when Tyrone Guthrie had done Merchant of Venice with Dorothy Tootin, and I knew I was getting some blocking and some ideas that they had found, you know, that then Michael had used and then I had gotten. And it was really wonderful to feel a line in that way, because yeah. it's very hard, particularly here, since... Um, to me, I feel that Felix Anger is better known as a character all over the world than almost any character that's ever been created. What do you think? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I Did just like look it? at my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to ask a question? I have a question for the panel, but more specifically for Ms. Tischler. Uh, after having spent some time in one of those 40-hour-a-week classical conservatory programs, I now find myself trying to beat the cycle of finding representation and work and having them say, talk to us when you have more experience. How do I get around that cycle? Well. You should, uh, I think, try to do showcase work in the city, which you don't need an agent for, you know, and an agent wouldn't be interested in it because it's not much money. I think you also should try to go to the, the hundreds of resident theaters around the country, um, that, uh, which is the, the biggest employment source uh, on any equity contract is the resident theaters. And I think New York uh, you'll come back to if you want or not, um, but uh, it's important to work. And I think it's to work, uh, there's very few jobs here. There are very few jobs here. May the I ask a question? <laughs> how, do you, how do you get your, your, your talent? Uh, must it be submitted by an agent? No, no. Um, Where do you find it's a it? lot of ways. I mean, uh, I would go to Someone the Someone is not working in a play. You haven't seen them, but they want to be seen and heard by you. Well, what happens? I recommend people, to, uh, actors to directors, of uh -huh. you know, usually his, whose work I know. And I know it through going to the theater about five nights a week, and um, films too, or holding auditions at the, at the festival at, the, at my office, and to see the work of new actors. And, um, and that's how they come into the process. So you need to get auditioned, and you need to work. And you need to work. It's hard to work in New York. It's, there's more work outside of New York. So go west. <laughs> for, for each character, and Excuse then me? they select. Well, I think more than three or four. I mean, it depends. I mean, in a in a ten, fifteen actors for each role. Sometimes, oh, really? sometimes three or four, depending on the role. You know, we're we're working on Macbeth now, and you know, <coughs> there's not a lot of Lady Macbeths in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't the, know. but the producer, the director, and the author oh, make the God. final choice. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> said, how about you? <laughs> Would you like? I don't know how that means. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Playing Lady oh, Macbeth is I what know. it meant. I know. <laughs> and there's always and there's always dinner theater too, right? <laughs> uh, first, I want my name is Frank McGraw. I'd like to thank a Miss Stritch for starting the conversation on the audience. I think that was very important. Thank you. But my question is for Pamela Peyton Wright. Um, an actor or actress, I think, spends so much time in their training to become emotionally available. And you obviously are very, and I uh, uh, admire that work. How do you protect yourself from the abrasiveness of this industry? Oh. How do you mean protect? Uh, um. Valium. <laughs> I just I have a... Uh, maybe uh, maybe Miss Brown might have a, an answer to that since she's had some dealings with the network. Oh, uh, well, they're no. brutal experiences, I, aren't they? Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody feels it's a brace of that's up on this panel. I think everybody feels the love of an audience. And yeah, it's a tough the love business. Of what that's yeah, I think you're talking about the business, not the audience. Well, the business you know, itself. It's, it's still tough. it's it's still the business that you chose, and it's a wonderful it's a wonderful business. Well, it has. Its if you're working, it it's, it's a wonderful moment. business. Yes. Okay. Very, you have to <laughs> the whole problem in, in the business is working. <laughs> if you're working, it's a wonderful business. That's when you're out of work, it's a, it's a nightmare. Depends on how much you made on the time when you were working. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you could go spend it and have a lovely time. I think that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> to forget about it for a while. No, quite seriously. But there's a lot of... You know, I just looked at Vanessa and, and Wink because... No offense. Because I'm just rape roping you into this. 
There's a lot of terrible stuff about the, excuse me, the business we're in. There's a lot of negatives about show business. The rejection, the sadness, the things that performers go through, my God. And then there's the other wonderful thing. I mean, why should we be different than anybody else? I think it's like anything else. But it sure has its downs, Isabel. It has a tremendous wow. amount. I know, but you, that's what we started this by saying. I knew that I had to do this. Right. This exactly. is what I had to exactly. do more than anything else in the world, right. and, and therefore I'm but going I to do it. You really have to do it. You, you really have to. Don't think you could wake up in the morning if you could do something else to choose this. <laughs> that's right. Because it's very. Painful. I think Jean no, wants to say still something. No business like show. <laughs> 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 well, I think it's a horrible jungle, but, uh, you know, for many reasons, um, especially for the young people. And I think the young and the older people have got a lot of courage because they have to go through what I didn't have to go through when I was young. I think it is horrendous business, absolutely horrendous. And it says a lot for a lot of human beings, the fact that for moments when you're working together before you get it on, for moments on the stage, for moments in an audience, you do make something close to what it should really be like. But mostly, I think it's completely horrendous, and the young people have got a really horrible time of it. That's my view. And I think they're very brave. <laughs> I can't think of any better note to end this seminar on working in the theater. <laughs> uh, it, it's been stupendous. It's been a wonderful panel. And when I think that everyone on this panel is working, uh, could be Bob could sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> could either be um, having a nap, playing with their family, or, or just having a good lunch, or staying at home, or singing or taking a lesson, have given up their time and to come to the Graduate Center of the City University of New York to be with us today on this panel. Uh, it's just one of the seminars on working in the theater that the American Theater Wing gives. We do one on the performance and we do one on the playwright director and we do one on the performance on the production which is the whole show from option to opening from this time from London to New York. And also there is a seminar on the design. Uh, this is, these are the people that work in the creative end of the theater. And uh, there is also an American Theater Wing award to them, which goes out into off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway and has nothing to do with the Tony Awards, which is what we are best known for. But year after year, year after year, the American Theatre Wing works throughout the year to bring what is so good in the theater, the talents and the time and the concern. So thank you very much for being here.